Hi, this is a video on Plato and the mystery of the body. And what I'm going to do is develop some of the material from my video on um, the, the idea of the platonic forms. And I'm going to give a really concrete example developing, uh, as I mentioned from the end of that little lecture, some of my own ideas about the body that I, in this case, I'm going to present a, and credit to Plato because many of them are derived from him. But I'm, I'm going to talk also directly in my own um, philosophical vein, which is drawn from many sources, but Plato is really uh, one of the central ones. And I want to discuss uh, the idea of Plato's Platonic dualism in the course of explaining why I think if you're really interested in your bodily health, um, and um, you might want to be interested in Plato or in real philosophy. And this is also a really deep way of getting at the essence of what form or the idea of Platonic form could actually mean for people which isn't just intellectual, but it's actually transformative of the entire human experience, including the somatic or bodily experience. So I'm kind of assuming you watched the last video, but if not, I hope this will make some sense, but you can watch that. So remember that if um, form and uh, the idea of form has to do with actually a unified, harmonious integration of the invisible patterns that underlie reality and bring it into being, and the visible manifestations and the visible causes of those manifestations, then the idea of form is linked to something I didn't mention, which is eros. And this is very important in Plato. So the mysterious body is also the erotic body. And by eros here and the erotic, I am not excluding the contemporary, almost exclusively, you could say, sexual or lascivious sense um, but I'm rooting it in the original sense, which does have something to do with that, of course, which is just very deep desire, which is, of course, related to sexual procreative desire in animals that can do that. But animals do that. And Plato is not really um, he is thinking about animals, but he's thinking about Eros here as a distinctively human experience, which is, of course, also a god. So you have to remember that Eros for Plato and the ancient Greeks was a divinity. Um, it was not just an idea. All of our abstract ideas are just the bodies of dead gods that we've ceased to understand, as I you know, explain in a lot of my work. So the idea of the body is really powerful. Once you have the platonic understanding of um, what an idea is, then think about its implications for the human body. If the human body has an invisible uh, structure, which of course it must, and understanding that invisible structure in a, you could say, a platonic way as a form would imply understanding the connection between the invisible body or the essence of what the body is and the manifest body or the effects of the body that you can physically see or physically experience, for example, pleasure and pain, then that implies a pretty extraordinary kind of insight into you know, what the human is. And it also implies the potential for a kind of pretty powerful enhancement or healing of what the human is. And that's part of why I teach Plato is because Plato helped heal me um, physically from very severe illness. Um, it was part of a very complicated, deep process that you could say was very spiritual as well. But Plato was part of that. And the intellectual component, which is what I'm focusing on here, was essential. So think about this, first of all, think about the fact that most philosophers today, including people who will critique so-called platonic dualism, the idea of the mind and the soul is somehow being distinct, and that's a terrible thing. They have no account of the body, none. And so I want to start with this obvious fact. No one in our society has a coherent account of what the human body is in modern Western society. There's a very simple reason for this. The way in which we understand, there's many reasons, but this is the simple scientific reason, the way in which we understand modern medical science makes it impossible to have an account of what the human body is as an organized, unified, living thing. And why? Because modern medical science is basically still, which is very powerful, but it's still stuck in a very well-known um, and unfortunate limitation, which is it has a kind of engineering, mechanistic mindset, which it inherits basically from the Enlightenment period when people were still, you know, bleeding people because they thought that was a good idea. So you know, a lot of the medical ideas even 200 years ago were insanely destructive to human well-being and life, even though they were considered totally scientific. So medical science, because it's just derived from what you could say is the more just fundamental science of studying the human body, not necessarily to heal it, but just what is the human body, is extremely good in the Western tradition on everything to do with the physical structure 
of the body as a kind of engineering mechanism. We have just the most amazing developments in that way. However, related to kind of food issues, which I've discussed in a, a course I'm doing on the sort of American paradox of why Americans are so obsessed with food and yet so unhealthy or they have such unhappy relationship to food, you could also say there's an American body or medical paradox, which is that related to food, Americans are sort of extremely anxious about our health and we're extremely unhealthy as a society, um, even though we have, you know, the, the best medical care in the world, meaning the sort of scientific medical system has great insight at the kind of engineering level into the components of many of the human biological systems, which is just extraordinary and we should all be very grateful for. However, all of us know that doesn't say anything about what the human body is. To understand the human body, you have to realize there's at least a couple basic questions you have to have an intelligible way of understanding before you can even get at the body. First of all, the body is alive. Anyone who doesn't know the difference between a body and a corpse certainly can't give us a good medical account of what the human body is. But there is no scientific account of what the difference is between a body and a corpse, meaning we can measure life in many different ways, but as those of you who study these things know, those things change and are contingent. For example, we can do things to people to revive them now when they're physically dead from the standpoint of even contemporary medical science and a lot of the old standards. So what does that mean? Does that mean doctors are resurrecting people from the dead when, for example, they send electrical charges into the heart to restart it? I mean, that's In a way, it's an interpretive question. How you interpret that is also related to how do you interpret you know, near-death experiences and medical literature around them? They're, they're difficult questions and they're never purely scientific. They always have to be informed by what we know scientifically, of course, but we also have to be aware that what we have is the current science of the body in the Western world is very limited. And as a result, throughout much of the 20th century, for example, in the long, really interesting story of how uh, yoga, for example, comes to America, which really goes back at least, you know, the 20s in some ways and earlier. But then there's different waves of yoga coming to America before it's now really popular, about maybe 50 to uh, 100 years into its arrival in American culture. Yoga itself is a sort of extraordinary example of how Americans assimilate um, sort of ancient wisdom to their modern understandings even if those modern understandings are sort of exactly limiting out what the unique insights of these other traditions are. So from the standpoint of a lot of the yogis who brought, for example, this form, say Indian yoga, obviously the word can be used much more broadly, and there's many different schools of yoga, but those who brought that to us felt that they had a science of the human experience and human person, including of the human body, that they felt was in no way um, challenged by the great advances of medical science, but that they felt would help deepen and, and give a different perspective to. And their understanding of the body, as in any sort of traditional spiritual or esoteric tradition, is, a, is an understanding that is from the Western standpoint completely paradoxical because it is oriented towards an object that our science doesn't even represent, which is you could say the body as a living entity, which has a kind of obviously an essence or a structure which is invisible. And then the relationship between that living entity and its invisible structure and its visible form. So it is exactly through partly the basic practices of conditioning the body that you gain access to the deeper layers of the body. Um, and that is extremely similar. In a way, it's almost identical at a structural level. Something like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras has extraordinary direct parallels with, you could say, kind of platonic mystical practice. So the platonic idealism that people attribute to Plato, the idea that because there is a form of the body, which is animated by the life of the body or the soul of the body, um, and because Plato regards these things as separate, which incidentally everyone uh, did in his society in some way, Plato is working with a much more developed idea of the soul, you could say through scientific philosophical development since Pythagoras at least, but everyone in the ancient world basically thought there's aspects of the body that could potentially exist without the body, even if it's then a miserable existence. The Greeks thought that the post-mortem existence you see in Homer was very miserable. You see this particularly in, in the Odyssey, a very famous passage when uh, Odysseus visits the underworld and meets Achilles. And Achilles, who is this great godlike hero, so hates the sort of existence he's suffering without his, his body and the way we understand it, that he would prefer to be a low-level person 
uh, with no status or dignity than to be where he's at. So there was a lot of different views and it wasn't all positive, um, but people just took it for granted that some part of the body was invisible and that that part of the body, whatever it was, could exist outside of this form. And that that's what it was that passes out of the human when humans die. And that's the transition from a living human body to a corpse is partly the transition of whatever this thing is, your soul, your life breath, leaving you. What in Hebrew sometimes people might identify with what's called nefesh. And the rabbinic tradition has very detailed interpretations of this. But what it means in the original ancient texts is a, is a, a, di a distinct question from the rabbinic interpretations, although they're obviously very useful and authoritative due to the mastery of you know the context and the languages but the ancient world had a lot of shared ideas about the body and one of them is very important that we recover and it's the fact that the body really is of course animated by a fundamentally invisible substance which is to say breath and breath is related to many of the words for soul or spirit like pneuma um, or like related in more complicated ways, for example, to things like psuche and anima in Latin. So if you think about the breath, notice that immediately the breath is the higher level that every advanced system of physical training works with. And in basically every level of training, this is why I teach a kind of martial arts or yogic component to people who actually really want to study philosophy in a really thorough way with me, is you have to maintain and develop a basic physical control over your body. You have to develop coordination. You have to develop uh, an internal harmoniousness so that the body can move with regularity according to number, um, which produces a degree of gracefulness, flexibility, and the capacity for the body and all of its joint systems to basically be fully mobile. And if you look at Taoism, um, if you look at uh, Zen Buddhism, and they're very connected, but say if you look at the the traditions of martial arts that are associated with Wudang or the traditions of martial arts associated in China with uh, Zen Buddhism, Shaolin, or if you look at um, basically almost any form of traditional yoga, you'll find that the control of the visible body, the stuff people think is cool, is just the first surface of what real training is about, right? In yoga, of course, you only do asana in, in the classical yogic system to turn the body into a single unmoving thing. Only when the body, the, the thing that we think of as our physical body is stable and unmoving, can you begin to access the deeper layers inside of you that are still very unstable. So you have to first stabilize the most crude or easy to work with thing, which is our sense of physical voluntary control over bodily motion. And the idea of asana, at least in a, as I understand it, I'm not a I'm not a yoga instructor. My partner teaches yoga, um, and we do martial arts and stuff. But the my understanding is that you know reading Patanjali and stuff is that you you have to create this fixed point first in the body, and then eventually with your consciousness, you have to be able to concentrate on a single thing with complete sort of focus. And then what that means, you all find different analogs that differ significantly in different traditions of Buddhism, sort of Platonic mysticism, you know, and yoga. Every tradition, in a way, will have certain commonalities, but then very big differences about some of these things. But the patterns are really amazing, and the patterns are very continuous. So the reason you do asana and yoga is eventually, of course, in traditional yoga, to move on to pranayama, uh, which is the control of the breath. And every deep uh, martial arts system, uh, typically, and every deep system of body work will generally evolve in some of its forms to a fundamental focus on breath. And breath is invisible. Um, and breath is very, in a way, secretive and esoteric. For example, if you're a vocalist or if you know classically trained vocalists, the sort of exercises that vocalists do, which are very similar for obvious reasons to um, exercises that a lot of acting traditions will use, are very strange seeming because um, people who, who don't, they look weird, right? But they involve gaining access to parts of your body that you can't directly touch. So you have to use mental tricks and games in order to get your body into a certain position. And then through practicing those temporary forms, you'll eventually achieve abilities that you don't have to consciously think about anymore, which is to say you develop internal powers. So training the voice is training an internal system, physically, of course, related to your diaphragm, but really it has to do with your entire body's capacity to work harmoniously and to 
manage breath, manage oxygen, and then express it in a beautiful, consistent way, say tonally, if you're singing. In martial arts, it's related. Um, different traditions will, again, differ very much, but the focus on breath is a common feature of what people will often call internal martial arts, which is just, but any good martial art will teach you this. You have to learn once your body's in basic control to regulate your breathing and to know how to use your breathing to create certain effects in yourself. And then through those effects, kind of like a tool um, on your opponents or whatever. So developing breath control is basically the essence of all esoteric practices, whether it's, you know, many forms of a conventional Western, you know, sleight of hand type magic or other things you end up having to develop or miming, which is a very interesting um, system, but you end up developing very deep practices of internal control. And so basically to access the true body, almost every tradition agrees that you eventually have to be seated or laying down totally still doing things invisibly, like inside of yourself. So note that the very premise of this is connected to what I mentioned about Plato, which is that the context of Plato's idea of the body is temples. And the context of what people call Platonic dualism, people very much misunderstand. Plato rightly understood that we start off confusing all parts of ourselves with the rest of ourselves. And we don't know what our body is. We know this seems to be our body, but I would suggest to you, um, I'm not going to teach, never teach about stuff like this publicly on YouTube, but I would suggest to you that what we think of as our visible body, of course, is just an expression of something else deeper that is connected to us. For example, you could just say literally our breath and our blood systems, our circulatory systems, which Chinese medicine, for example, is a very, you know, organized way of thinking about the integrated levels of different forms of energy. And that is connected to forms like Ayurvedic medicine from India and other things. So when you get into the body, literally, what are you getting into it with? Your mind. How do you get into your body with your mind? Through stillness and through regulated harmonious motion. What is the purpose of getting access to the inside of your body? Well, in a basic sense, awareness and control. In fact, one of the most beautiful things about yoga that uh, Mircea Eliade in his book on yoga mentions is that, I mean, he talks about how yoga in many ways anticipates sort of psychotherapeutic movements by thousands of years because of its understanding of the many layers of the unconscious. But one of the ideas in yoga is that the idea is to be liberated. And this is an image we have in Plato, the idea that the body is a prison which St. Paul uses also the same image and puns on it, Asoma Sema. It's a very famous pun in the history of philosophy and religious thought. But what is the actual invisible nature of the body? Well, think about what a great athlete can do. If you watch parkour, for example, think about what people can do. They can literally leap over buildings. Most humans can't do that. They would die. How is it that some humans can do them? Well, they have a very different um, developed relationship to what the potential of the body is. And they do that through training. And through training the body, the body takes on powers that are quite extraordinary from a physical, observable standpoint. And of course, all this kind of stuff can generally create all kinds of crock of nonsense, of which there's all fakery, of course, everywhere. But there's also real things that underlie this. If you just told a person there's people who can jump 25 feet off of a building, you know, if they've never seen videos of that, they might not think that's real, but it is real. And once you recognize it's real and you can watch YouTube videos, then you begin to realize when you read accounts of historical things like, say, ninjas or something like that, of course it's possible that there were great warriors, say, who were specially trained who could jump 20 feet, just like we see in the Olympics or something. But that would obviously create legends because that isn't a normal human thing. Now imagine that that same kind of ability is directly expressed not in the outward physical body where you can see, but the same kind of enhancement of ability is expressed internally. For example, cognitively, through your mental powers, through your ability to understand things. There's all this talk in our culture about biohacking, a word I deeply hate. It's a disgusting abuse of the body to treat it like it's a mechanistic computer when we're alive. But uh, the word biohacking, I understand, it's just the idea of people who are sort of caught up in the metaphor of computers. Fair enough. Um, we build computers. We often forget this. Um, we, but we become like our images if we're foolish and we forget that we made them. We make computers with the power of our minds, which are necessarily invisible and immaterial. Um, if we made them in the images of our brains, that would be a great accomplishment. We have no idea yet how to do that. Although stuff like neural nets, you know, we're working on that and it's very exciting. 
But the simple reality is uh, the assumption of Plato is that the strong distinction he makes, especially in the Phaedo, which is a deeply esoteric text, which is designed to initiate people physically into an understanding of philosophy that is also very spiritual. And it creates a very enhanced capacity to understand the processes of your psyche in the deepest sense, including your unconscious processes. The idea then is that there is an invisible essence to your body that you can only learn to access by beginning to distinguish what you think of as your body from your mind. So if you're not willing to, to ask the question, what is the thing that is animating my body? And what is the thing that's talking right now that you're listening with, that I'm talking with? I'm talking through my body, but it's not my body that's talking. My body without my life wouldn't be able to speak or be extremely creepy like in a horror movie. It's not a real human being in that sense. It's something we would think of as a kind of weird state, an occultic state or something people wouldn't maybe think is real. So we are animated. And in order to understand ourselves, we have to understand both what animates us and what is animated. And that is the opposite of what people think of as platonic dualism. Platonic dualism is the opposite of Cartesian dualism, which really is, here's a mind which is pure and invisible and here's body and I have no understanding of how they're connected. Although Descartes had a pretty plausible theory, interestingly, about the pineal gland, uh, which is actually connected to ancient ideas of anatomy. But basically, there's no understanding of how they relate. Plato is not like that. Plato actually thinks that by understanding them separately, you can then coordinate them and they will enhance you dramatically. You gain power over yourself and you gain power over both your body. Like Socrates had a kind of miraculously powerful, strong body and was very like capable aesthetically. Um, and you gain power over your mind, which of course you also see Socrates has this extraordinary mind. So the platonic body is really a journey into the mystery of what animates the body which starts to me, I would say for any person traditionally, it starts with control and awareness of the breath. And this is, I hope, a way of understanding a bridge between what seems like the very academic idea of platonic forms, but then thinking about what would the form of the body, what would be the invisible thing manifest in the body? And then just think of that as a beginning as breath. We can then begin to understand, oh, wow, actually, it seems like Plato is both deeply connected to, you know, what we would think of as Eastern traditions, but also deeply connected to a deeply body-affirming, world-affirming philosophy, which only talks about the body as a prison because the body is a prison. Until a person understands that their body is both radically more than what they are aware of, and in another sense, radically less than what they are, they can't understand the body or the mind, whatever you call either of those things. We can still recognize a distinction. We can recognize a distinction about that through which we speak, that's why we say we have a body, but we don't normally say we are a body. The human self isn't identical with its body, and we know that. That's part of what we know even just through consciousness um, and sleep, as you could say it's neurologically active, absolutely, but it's still mental activity, and we don't know how to explain that. But once you recognize if you believe dreams are important, which I do, for example, and unconscious processes are important, then it becomes important just from a physical standpoint to think, how could I gain access to those processes? Well, that's part of what philosophy in its ancient sense is designed to initiate people into. And it's part of why physical training and you could say moral or training of just your habits is an essential part of then training the mind. So I hope that gives you some more exciting insight into a platonic understanding of form, a kind of root, uh, a tradition of understanding the body rooted in Plato that I'm trying to present in a kind of way that shows the connections with other cultures. And that also then builds a bridge between understanding Western philosophy, platonic form in the body, and then you could say other uh, bodywork traditions, martial arts and other things. So I hope this is of value to you and thank you very much for listening. This is part of the Becoming Human Project. Please do support my work through Patreon. You can um, get material from me or look into studying with me at my website, samuelankar.com, and check out my other videos. Please do share if you like it, like the video, and subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much.